starting context is that NATO is more than a military alliance. It's about smart power as well as hard power. So that means that it has to develop ties to the people it protects. The context that I want to bring to the discussion that we'll have now with our three fantastic panelists is that we need to have uh, NATO communicating to the populations and also embodying the populations and the diversity of the populations that it serves. So I'll quickly introduce our three panelists. You can see uh, their bios in the app. We don't need to go into a huge amount of detail. We've got Lima Ahmad from the NATO Defense College, Isabel Aradon from the International Crisis Group, and Lieutenant General Stephen Shepro from the NATO Military Committee. So thanks so much for joining us. But before we hear from each of our panelists, I want you to all get out your smartphones or your laptop, whatever device you've been using the NATO Engages app on. And if you go to the home screen, I'd like you to go into the interactive session, uh, section of the app and go into the part of word cloud. And we're going to ask you, what is the word or the phrase, we'll separate it into two different word clouds, that you associate with the concept of inclusive security. So take a moment to do that, and then we'll start to hear from our speakers. Lima, I'd like to turn to you first. NATO is a very different alliance to when it was originally established. It's now got out-of-area operations. You're from Afghanistan, so you've experienced those uh, firsthand. So why don't you kick us off uh, with a couple of minutes about what NATO is now like on those front lines outside of the, the geographic area of the alliance. Thank you, Ryan. Um, two minutes, uh, NATO in Afghanistan since 2013, since 2003. Um, um, with both its uh, missions, ISAF and now the Resolute uh, Support Mission, um, both we have learned a lot. There are lots of lessons learned um, that NATO could uh, incorporate to in its future missions. Um, and one really crucial uh, lesson learned is that acknowledging the, the, the need and the necessity of women inclusion into the security sector. But coming back to uh, Afghanistan, I think um, our experience with NATO was that NATO operations were mainly or largely uh, focused on the main state, like the government. The relationship between NATO mission was more focused on the state rather than NATO to people, NATO to women. Um, so that is something, uh, although we have now the uh, civilian office, civilian ambassador there that engages more civ civil society members and uh, talk to more people, what is really needed. But I think throughout my experience with the research in the security sector and NATO involvement in Afghanistan, I have come to one realization that um, uh, we have really not... Um, accepted or acknowledged the need and the necessity of women in the security sector, which I would see that NATO should be doing in its future engagement with women in Afghanistan, why women is important, because women um, engagement or uh, inclusion into the security sector is seen as a larger agenda or part of the larger ag agenda of women empowerment in Afghanistan rather than a crucial need into the security sector. So. That is what my area of research is focused on. Thanks, Lima. Isabel, one of your areas of expertise is gender perspectives. Tell us a little bit what goes wrong when we don't include gender perspectives in our security operations and framework. Sure. So I'll, uh, I'll stand Please. up if you allow We want allow to be as me. interactive as possible. Um, yeah, so you're asking me uh, what can go wrong if we don't integrate gender perspectives in, in, in operations. Well, for me, I think it goes back to the actual definition of, of inclusive security. And I'm actually very eager to see what you are all coming up with in relation to the definition. Um, back 20 years ago, I think when we were thinking about security, at least for NATO, that was really about state security. Uh, making sure there would be no open violence in relation to those various territories that we're talking about. But really, when we're talking about inclusive security today, this is a security for all these populations. And of course, uh, um, uh, we talked about that in relation to Afghanistan. What is security for the men, for the women, the boys, the girls? How would they define security in their homes? What is peace? Uh, um, and what is the ultimate goal for an organization like, like NATO? And, um, and of course, there are lots of things that can go wrong. Um, if you start uh, missing part of the population, 
you can actually misunderstand what security is about. Uh, you can uh, have a bad decision and uh, you can, um, instead of protecting the full population, what, what you can see is um, more violence for some um, of these populations, and I'm thinking about gender-based violence, who can actually be committed by the troops themselves, or that can be gone uh, unchecked uh, on the ground. So that's one of the striking examples that has come over the years, of course. But it's more than that. It's really about making sure, both internally and externally, within the security operations, um, there is full understanding from within and externally as to what is going on. And that's about smart security, really, inclusive security. But I'm curious to see uh, all the definitions you come up with. And we will come to you shortly. You can check out the answers you've been giving on the word cloud on those screens behind you. Lieutenant General, uh, you're inside uh, NATO, literally. So tell us uh, from within how you are building that architecture to deliver a more inclusive security. Well, thank you, Ryan, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to pick up the same thing that, uh, that uh, Lima and Isabel started, and that's the importance of inclusivity in our operations. You know, we will talk a lot about defense investment pledging, as I'm sure you've discussed this morning, 2% and 20%. But to the military, still above all these things, our most important asset remains our people, and our people as individuals, and our people cohesively as teams. Operationally, we talk about we have to do the right things right. And certainly foremost on that list is inclusivity. My personal experience as a NATO operational commander, and now as the deputy chairman here, is that 100% of a population is always better than 50%. Tapping 100% of national populations for the forces, respecting 100% of populations in those forces. And as Lima said, engaging 100% of the population in our operations in support of projecting stability, fighting terrorism, is invaluable. And so I think NATO has been building the tools that it needs to do for inclusivity. It's in our doctrine, it's in our training, and it's in our dialogue. So we started out this year with a visit from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Special Envoy Angelina Jolie, to talk about conflict-related gender-based violence and how we could address that in our operations. And it comes to, again, inclusivity. We had the 42nd annual conference on gender-based perspectives. And once again, we had more people than the previous year. So over 130 participants, 42 allies and partner nations. This is progress. And we've been making progress. And it's thanks to a strong gender advisory network and uh, an engaged ambassador, Hutchison, who, uh, who is behind this work, that we've been able to capitalize on NATO's greatest strength. And what is that greatest strength? It's diversity. And so I get to watch 22 different national perspectives melded on how to do this better and how to be more creative, innovative, and make progress. We still have a long ways to go, but we've made progress and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Isabel Lima, uh, do you agree? How do you rate the progress uh, in terms of the actual operations that you analyze and have, have experienced directly? I think progress has been made, um, certainly from NATO side, UN side, and all the international organizations that are involved. But what I believe is the progress has been made with intention that we want to do something. Um, for example, in Afghanistan, NATO mission has gender advisor and focal points in all their offices. But we have not invested as much investment we should do to make that more a functioning forces uh, rather than just saying that it's the start. We have to wait a little bit more. So for me, it's like if we are doing something, we have to invest more, like the political, creating political will on the higher level in Afghan government. In the NATO, it is there, but we have to be investing in budget, budgeting on those political will. So that's about that. relationships as well as the finances. It's not just cutting a check. Exactly. I would just give you an example of when I 
I did conduct interviews with NATO officials, with security sector in Afghanistan. Most of the answer what I got from you both was like, you, you, uh, women are the 50 percent of the country, so we should involve them, but not much specific why. But then I was confused. Can I write all these answers as a one answer in my paper? So I went to like my mother. I asked her why is it important that we should have women in the security sector. She said, I go every day on the bus, I get harassed. If I go to a police officer, he will not understand. But if I, I will have more courage if there is a female uh, police officer and tell her because she might have gone through that and she will understand what, what, what I am talking about so I will get the protection. So this opened that I was talking to more ordinary women not specialized in the security sector to see why it is an important thing. So that thing, in my opinion, has been not done. We have really good plans and Afghanistan, Afghan government has um, developed in 2015 to implement the 1325 um, uh, UNICEF uh, plan for women, uh, for women. And also NATO has done the same thing, but what we have done to operationalize those plans and policies is a little bit we need more to, more, more to be doing to operationalize it and to bring changes, in my opinion. We've got enough conflicts out there in the world, Isabel. Surely we also have some best practices that we have developed in handling those conflicts and preventing conflicts. What, what's your perspective uh, from Crisis Group? Right. Um, well, I think there are two issues. First, on the issue of the progress, whether so NATO has made progress, I, I thought I should just comment on a couple of things. One is that, of course, uh, diversity is more than just bringing uh, women around the table. It's, I think, very important that uh, we ensure, whether we're talking about NATO or UN peacekeeping forces, that there is, of course, greater representation of, of women in the forces on the ground. But I think when we're talking about diversity, again, it's more than that. It's also thinking about uh, diversity along ethnic, religious lines, age, and, um, and, and that... Um, everyone really has a chance to contribute uh, in, in relation to these issues. On best um, uh, lessons learned across the globe, I mean, unfortunately, as uh, UN Secretary General Guterres would say, uh, the world uh, is facing a number of uh, huge challenges at the moment. People on the move have never been uh, as many at the moment. Uh, deadly violence uh, um, is uh, widespread in many places. I mean, just to say a few, Yemen uh, is one of our big preoccupations, but also Syria. I'm also thinking about the lecture at Basin and the humanitarian crisis there. In terms of the lessons learned, it is essential for efficient security forces today to be diverse in relation to um, uh, their various departments not to have just one specific se section to deal with women's issues, but to, to be truly diverse, but also to have analyses about gender dynamics. And it's one of our strong lessons at the International Crisis Group. In order, for example, to understand what was going on in relation to the Boko Haram insurgency and the female suicide bombing that are going on at the moment, one could have really done a very interesting gender analysis at the outset of that conflict to really understand power relations between men and women, why some of the women were attracted to join Boko Haram. Similarly, uh, some sort of uh, similar analysis could be done in relation to those women who were attracted to join uh, ISIS uh, back a few years ago. Was the analysis done by security forces? And what about Somalia, for example, now? So les lessons learned, I'd say, have gender advisors close to the top of your hierarchy and make sure the gender analysis is integrated throughout the, 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 the full spectrum of uh, decision making. Thank you. Now, it would not be an inclusive security session if I didn't include all of you. So I'm going to come very quickly now uh, to questions from the audience. Who's got a question? I will. Yes, the gentleman in the front and the woman in the back with the, the blue top in the back row. My, my name is Ilter Turan. I'm from Istanbul Bilgi University. I think we're dealing with a highly confusing concept called inclusivity because on the one hand, I think some of us employed it as representativeness and in other cases, it was employed as support. And when we talk about support, is it support from the populations that support NATO or is it support from the populations where NATO operations are conducted? So this is a highly confusing concept, and I'm concerned that trying to achieve uh, 
uh, inclusiveness in one domain undermines it in the other domains. Like we talked about ethnic and gender representativeness, which clearly uh, is very needed, but at the same time, it may very much undermine what you're trying to achieve in areas where you are conducting domestic operations. So, uh, you know, it would be useful to specify the concept a little bit more, but I have a question to the general, and that is, uh, do you think the current organization of the military is such that it is able to achieve as much inclusiveness, particularly with regard to populations with whom you have to deal with in your operations, rather than support from the populations that are members of NATO countries? Thank you. I appreciate that question. So to clear up any confusion, for NATO, it's the right thing to do to promote inclusivity in our forces. We're a values-based organization. and. This is not only the right thing, but it's a good return on investment, too, because we're more effective. So that's one thing. In the areas we operate, I agree that our values not, are not always the same values of where we operate. But what we found is that, one, we hold up a good model, and countries want to emulate that. And so what I've seen is that inclusivity that we've modeled has led to inclusivity in the areas where we are. First, in the national forces. In fact, when I was in Afghanistan, the first female pilot graduated, and it was one of the best pilots of that, of that year in that school. And so I think it helps their forces be stronger. And then, as Lima um, implied as well, when we have inclusive, gender-balanced forces, they can reach the population better. Do I think the organization is fostering that? I, th I think it is. We're obviously not there yet, and we could talk about the many barriers to making progress. But as I said, we have been making progress, and I think we could do both be a model as well as engage in those countries with the model we have. Thank you. Quick follow-up. No. Have you got the resources you need to make the progress you want? You know, when you say we, and when somebody says, what is NATO doing this or NATO doing that, I always have to remind everyone that there is no NATO apart from the 29 allies. The NATO is the 29. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the resources we need are always going to be a decision of the 29. Each member, of course, has their statistics and how, mu how inclusive they are. And so we depend on every link in the chain. So in a way, it does come back to that uh, Trumpian question of hitting the 2014 commitments of, of spending more. If overall forces can spend more, there's a bigger part to go towards these issues. It is, but it's not just the amount of money, of course, it's how we spend it. You know, we could spend poorly, but my point is, is that people are always going to be a high return on investment. Absolutely. Uh, now, the, the woman in the back row in the blue Hi, uh, Professor Heidi Hart from University of California, Irvine. Uh, my question is uh, related to incorporating a gender perspective at the strategic planning uh, level. So could you talk to us a little bit about how in the military committee uh, that perspective is incorporated or if it is, um, and some examples? Um, uh, and I'm wondering if there are any other examples of how maybe that translates into some of the communications that are going on and, and the strategic thinking at the level of the NAC. Thank you. So not to monopolize the conversation, monopolize it. Um, this next year is going to be the year of strategy. So we're going to have new political guidance come out. We're developing a new military strategy, graduated response plans. So as you know, we're doing a lot of strategic thinking. Our gender advisors help us ensure that inclusivity is in that, that strategic guidance, which of course then percolates into different actions across the board. So I would say at the strategic level, we are incorporating inclusivity and it's being codified, which is important, especially in NATO. You know, if you want something done, you have to codify it. So uh, I, I'm optimistic. And of course, next year we'll see these documents. So I'll be able to tell you for sure. Thank you. Okay. We will come to some more questions in a second. We have a, the gentleman over here uh, in the silver tie and, and then the gentleman here, but we're going to keep it gender balance. Uh, I have one question for everyone on the panel, though, which is 
are all NATO allies equally committed to this issue? Do you see an unevenness across the alliance to uh, both awareness and acceptance of this need to, to codify and really embed these ideas into NATO operations? Um, so maybe I'll turn to the women on the panel first and then, and then to the general. Um, I will be less politically correct because I am in the, um, the, the experience of collecting data for my research where I meet um, all the mission member states that are involved in Afghanistan. So I have received these different answers. For example, from the U.S., I was directly told that, Lema, you should be talking more to the European member states because they are really good when it comes to gender inclusivity within the security. Because in the U.S., if we are not doing well, how we can help Afghan, Afghan uh, security forces. So similarly, um, different countries involved in Afghanistan within the NATO, they have different doctrine. And one thing which you mentioned about document, I will be really looking forward to because we, I could not find any document that has been done by the doc, doctrine process, de de development process, which could be counted as a Bible of gender inclusivity uh, for the NATO because the documents have been produced between bilaterally by two countries or three countries mm -hmm. or for the need of the mission, but not something that we could draw from like all the NATO nations could draw from how these things should be done. So in my opinion, um, things have been developed, but not like we don't have something like fundamentally to be looking forward to that we can see like this is ABCD of the gender and we can incorporate from that into our missions. Isabel. Thanks. I, I think it's a, it's a great question and I thought I would actually link it up with the issue of uh, resources. Because, uh, you know, trying to reflect on that, it's true since the passing of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, a number of uh, member states to NATO have developed national action plan uh, to show that basically they, they are trying to work towards uh, full implementation of the Security uh, Council Resolution. But then what about financial commitment to NATO in relation to ensuring the gender perspective is actually integrated across political and security structures? Um, of course, um, uh, Lieutenant General has mentioned the fact that there is a special envoy on women, peace and security, Claire Hutchinson, and, and that position has been in place for a few years. There is a committee on gender perspective. There is also now a... Um, civil society advisory uh, panel to NATO on women, peace and security, and I recognize a, a member there. I, I am also sitting on the panel. But those very few uh, initiatives um, are, are not um, massively financially supported. supported. And at a time when we are discussing whether there will be more financial investment by member states uh, to NATO, will it mean greater investment to make sure those NATO commitment to women, peace and security will also be delivered. And I, and I, I think checking who is contributing to what, I don't have the uh, exact figures for you today, would be interesting in order to respond um, in, in detail to your question. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant General. So I do have the exact figures, but I'm not going to discuss them. What I will say is, as a as an alliance of 29, 29 unanimously agreed to the goals. And so, for instance, there's a goal of 15% of, of women in our forces and in NATO operations. So looking at trends, at the turn of the century, we were at 6%. And now, on the average, we're over 11%. And we continue to trend upward. So I measure commitment in terms of progress and in terms of what the alliance has agreed to in terms of goals. Like I said, we're far from being where we want to be, but we have commitment and we have progress. And I believe it's not linear, it's exponential. Once you have more women in leadership positions, it's a virtual circle because then you have more women in the population that want to do what you do. Thanks. Uh, we turn to this side of the room now. It's the gentleman with the silver tie, if we can get him a microphone. Thank you. Uh, Brandon from One. I have a question to Lima about NATO's experience with security sector reform. Um, because we briefly touched on uh, how improperly managed uh, security forces can exacerbate horizontal inequalities, 
um, and perpetuate local conflicts. And at the same time, we see that when SSR is, is, is exclusively technical, it tends to overlook some of the deeper problems like fiscal corruption and, and, and governance. And so my question is, uh, what are the lessons learned from NATO's extensive uh, experience with SSR in Afghanistan, and how could some of those best practices be transposed in future missions? Difficult question. <laughs> um, I think in Afghanistan, I think, uh, before me looking into the topic, um, in Afghanistan, our belief was like, even as academic, we as Afghan, we do not know much about what is happening when it comes to the people, not to the government. There, like, there will be really few people in Afghanistan that will know the difference between NATO operations and the U.S. operation in Afghanistan. So, so that, that miscommunication or the gaps of communication between Afghan and the mission itself was there. But when you come inside it and see there are so much um, lesson learned has been recorded and there are much being invested to record all the lesson learned. But where I see more gaps and also opportunities that those lesson learned are recorded but not much incorporated into the future plans. Like they have been not used to improve on the programming in Afghanistan, especially like when it comes to um, the women in security issues. When I was talking to, they say we have so much on budget and off budget projects for women initiatives, but the women projects do not get approved soon or they don't get pro prioritized. Money comes in, but people do not follow up so those projects can get running and be implemented. So, so lesson learns are there, but how much we are prioritizing them to incorporate them into our operations. And the second thing I would just be talking about, for example, when I met Claire Hutchinson, she told me that one issue that we have that is that we put women into this large category of women. We don't see women as a women victims of war, women as a criminals of war, and women as a security forces in war. We don't differentiate between these different uh, categories of women that we can put in. And the lesson learned, we have those things, but what programming we have done for that to bring into more positive changes is that we have to be looking into, into the future of NATO engagement in Afghanistan. To balance out the gender questions, I'm going to go to Karina Horst, actually, if we can bring a microphone down to the front row. And then there's two gentlemen over here. I'm not forgetting you. Thank you. Um, Corinna Hurst from WISE, uh, um, one of the organizers, but also with the German Marshall Fund. Um, a quick question, I really, to the panel, but it's also to a larger audience. Um, gender diversity often gets sidelined as a women's issue, so how do we get men on board to actually change? Maybe we'll turn to the man who is on board for a bit of perspective. <laughs> now, you know, I appreciate that question because I don't want to focus on statistics at the expense of the need to change a culture. And so obviously we have an inertia that we're overcoming from the past. And so I think it's important that we, we bring this in the beginning, not as an afterthought, but in our discussions as an integral part. You know, a lot of times we put together doctrine, we put together plans, and then it's, oh, the gender advisor remind us we need to tag on an appendix on you know, women, and that's the wrong approach. It needs to be part of the culture and the inception, and right now, around the military committee, there are a lot more men than women, exclusively men. And so there does need to be that continual so cultural change. And the point that was raised is considering the women that are serving as leaders as leaders. So in the United States, the first ever female combatant commander was General Lori Robinson. And she once told me, and my wife always tells me she knows when I'm going to say something intelligent because I start off by saying a woman told me something. She told me that she's not a woman who's a general, she's a general who happens to be a woman. And I think we, again, need that cultural shift. Thing. Mm -hmm. I'll throw in one thought uh, as the moderator, and it's not a particularly military-based thought, but it's about general uh, gender issues in organizations. I think you definitely do need commitment from the top. A lot flows when the very top people uh, not only say they're committed, but show through their actions that they're, they're committed to some kind of social change. But 
that is also an excuse that a lot of people use to, to not make reflections and changes in their own life. We all, even if it's the smallest decisions in our daily life, have the ability to impact the people around us. And if you don't absorb and uh, reflect that, and without wanting to confuse issues like the Me Too movement with this discussion, I would say that uh, discussions like we have seen around that Me Too discussion are something that have forced a lot of men to reflect on themselves and to, to maybe wonder, am I having an impact I didn't realize I was having? And I think that that's the underlying point that needs to be applied here, which is you do have impact on people around you. You can have a more positive impact if you think a bit harder about what that impact is, and that applies to men as well as women in this discussion. Yeah. So up the back in the, the blue time. Thank you. Yes. So this is Wakar from NATO Association of Canada. My question is to Lima Ahmed. Uh, what should be NATO's priority at the foreign land, especially Afghanistan, when you talk about the common people and common perception, inclusiv inclusivity or promoting NATO's image? Can we work on inclusivity without working on improving NATO's image? What, can NATO, what role NATO can play in this situation and will NATO be misunderstood if NATO would work on inclusivity first with, before improving NATO's image? I ask this question because I've raised in the, in, the, in, the, in the age of information manipulation. When we heard bombings when I was little in Pakistan, when I asked the question like who's bombing, I heard the name NATO for the first time in my life. Yeah. So I ask this question and I would invite your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's actually a really critical question, and I don't think so the responsibility of improving NATO's image only comes entirely on the responsibility of NATO. I would just take as an Afghan responsibility that Afghan government, uh, the previous one and this one, has really not invested in effort to, to communicate with its public, with the people, what NATO roles in Afghanistan is, especially uh, the Resolute Support Mission, which is a completely trained and advised mission which is there to support Afghan security forces. I mean, the, the mission only with its 16,000 troops are not only helping us with the training, but it is playing the role of deterrence. It's deterring the external threat regionally. It's helping us with internal deterrence, which are, there are so many factions. If, I mean, I have received even from the security expert these answer, if NATO only maybe symbolically were not there, we would have a civil war by now in Afghanistan. So one thing which I have in mind, like as a gap um, um, for the NATO, that the Star Starcom, they had so many plans and strategies that always they say we should be working on a campaign of recruiting women, of informing people. But what is lacking is that they are not delivering on that. So how they are in, uh, engaging with the people and read English and know what NATO is and what that is. So I think that responsibility should be taken by the Afghan government to launch such a campaign, talking to the people of Afghanistan. NATO is there, not as an invader. It is there to support our security forces because we need a security force to survive as a sovereign, a sovereign country. That thing is, I think, lacking on our side, which we should be doing. But when it comes back on the improving NATO image or an inclusive inclusivity of people, as for me, is that NATO has to be involved more with the people rather than with the government people. Because one answer I got from most NATO officials, either in Afghanistan or here, was that why we cannot have or why we should not have more women in the security sector. And their answer was really generic. Afghanistan is culturally not ready. And I was like, who told you? The Afghan government, this, this person told me. So that is not an inclusive ap approach because Afghanistan is ready for everything because it's a necessity. Women are dying, children are dying, so it, we, don't, we can't wait for more decades to be able to culturally evolve. Culturally, as Claire Hutchinson once told me, that culture is made. There is nothing that could stop us to to unmake it. Um, so for me, the image and the inclusivity can both come together. The Afghan government has to take responsibility and the NATO also has to take a little bit of responsibility how things to be done when they communicate well together. Thank you, Lima. Timely reminder that governments come and go, but people are always Very patient. Thank you for waiting. 
Thank you very much, Zafar Hashimi, Atlantic Council, Millennium Flow. Um, quick question uh, in the age of Me Too movement, what procedures are in place or has to be uh, in place so victims could speak up, victims of the past could speak up if they have you know, grievances, and what could be done to encourage them so uh, they're not becoming victims in the future? And a specific question for Lema regarding uh, women in Afghanistan. Uh, do you see a trend of changing Afghan women as a project to an, an institution or projects into an institution so Afghan women are uh, empowered and enabled to be equal citizens in the country? A quick clarification. Do you mean uh, that people have the ability to report uh, in areas where NATO has an operation or within NATO structures themselves? Within NATO structures. Okay. Maybe, Isabel, have you got something to jump in? Yes, well, I, of course, I, I, I cannot list for you uh, the policies in place within NATO, but I, I'm sure, like any uh, um, big international organization, there are procedures in place in relation to victims. The main challenge is, of course, even if you have great policies in place, uh, do you have a safe space to actually report? And uh, is there a meaningful system in place to enable you to uh, get some sort of... Uh, agreeable uh, uh, result as a result of you making a complaint. It's, it's, I think it's hugely sensitive. I, I must say I am, I am thrilled it has come in the open in this way. Many organizations all over the world are now asking themselves, do they have the right policies in place for men and women actually to submit a complaint, not just uh, women can be subject to uh, harassment within a particular institution. NGOs themselves are asking themselves whether they need to be fed their policy, so it's very healthy. Mm -hmm. But of course, it also brings us back to the issue of um, troops on the ground operating in very uh, volatile environments of uh, abuse by, by uh, elements within particular troops. And uh, it does indeed throw the question of how to do better in the future to make sure those very communities, those troops are there to uh, serve and protect, do not fuel new abuses. And so, again, it's about the leadership within those various forces to make sure they speak strongly against any form of abuse and harassment. It's making sure the policies are in, are in place, safe space, I'd say, for those part of the troops and those outside. And in a way, it's, I'm coming back to your point earlier about the meaning of inclusive security because there's something there which is, it brings, it's like a bridge between the within, internal an organization and, and externally. It's making sure it's in tune. Um, it's about the values we discussed today as well in this setting. You cannot project particular values and from within not abide by those values. And so for any institution, including NATO, it's about aligning those and uh, ma making sure they're meaningful internally, externally. And it's, it's not easy. It's a journey. I, I acknowledge that. Lieutenant General, how confident are you that those uh, reporting processes and practices uh, really work? Because we see so often that formal systems exist, but the people who use them often feel worse off at the end of the, the process. They yeah. might have contributed to a greater good, and they feel very traumatized having used the process. Absolutely. I thought Isabel just gave an excellent answer to that question, uh, by the way. So the reporting procedures are in place. In fact, as we've emphasized reporting over the last couple of years, what we've seen is actually the reported cases go up, mm -hmm. but more due to reporting than to cases. And then, of course, we started to see that trend change as, as we brought focus to this. But I'd underline what you said, Ryan, earlier and what Isabel just said. It's got to have leadership involvement. You know, the Afghans have one of their many wise proverbs is, if the water is bad at the top of the mountain, it'll be bad at the bottom of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So you have to have leadership involvement or else the process doesn't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lena. Yeah, so to your question, if uh, Afghan women are empowered or they are still seen as a project or they are empowered to make decision or to contribute their perspective to what is really needed. I think at the beginning, even uh, until up till now, uh, within the Afghan community, I would not specifically talk women. The Afghan government, uh, there is this belief that whatever investment 
the international community is doing on women is more symbolic to show that something is happening. For example, Afghan army women in the Air Force, or they are being trained, but much more is invested on how to advertise that to the world, that these are the Afghan army, rather than why they are needed and why we should have more. Um, just a statistics of money which was shared with me by the Resolute uh, Support Mission that only the United States in Afghanistan since 2001 has invested one, uh, 111 billion dollar, which 60% of that has gone to security sector. Out of that, only 0.6 has been spent on the military for women projects, and only 2% has been spent on national police for women. So out of 200,000 uh, army, only 1,200 are women so far we have. Like this is approximate number that I was given. So yeah, that is a project. We want to do it. But for me to, dis to start a discourse, what was already said, money is coming in. Like I do not believe that we should be investing money-wise, but which, which always saying like we should be doing things differently. Women in Afghanistan, I think they are at the point that they can give opinion. Even if they are not in power, their opinion is of their need today. And that has to be like exchanged to the program and make more programs for them to come in. Because right now, I think before this summit, when the, His Excellency, the Defense Minister was talking in his speech, one of the the phrase was that since two years, Afghan women are volunteering, volunteering for the military more than men, like the rate is higher than the men, but we don't have resources to recruit them. Mm -hmm. So that will be my answer. We're now in the final five minutes of the session, so I'm going to take two questions, one from the woman in the back, right in the middle here on this side of the stage. So she'll either need a microphone over the back row or someone has to come into the middle. And then also over here. And we'll do one round of responses after the two questions. Thank you very much, um, Jacqueline Hale from Save the Children. And I actually hesitate to put my question um, because conceptually I would oppose that we put women and children in the same bracket. Um, but given that one in six um, children uh, globally are now affected by conflict, and that's 100% of the population under the age of 18, I'm curious to hear um, uh, what NATO is doing actually to, to address this, um, not only at the technical level in terms of um, the response at, at the level of missions, um, in terms of advisory capacity um, and technical competencies, but also in terms of the tactics of warfare, given that uh, much of, ch uh, of the um, impact on children is happening in urban areas through the use of explosive weapons. Are there discussions amongst allies um, about how to limit those effects that disproportionately affect civilians, including children. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. And your question, ma'am. It, it's working. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Aliki Mitsakos from Greece. I'm Wise Greece and also APA Greece. Uh, I'm happy that I think the main points just came up the last five minutes, which is funding for projects, which is role models for women, because we do have programs for years, projects for years, I'm old enough, I remember, but never tangible results, because theory is one thing, practice is another. And it is also the willingness of, willingness of women to be involved, to dare to be involved, because in order to be involved, they need to be supported. And the programs, in words, do not support. So funding is a major uh, bracket mm -hmm. in the whole program. And in the military, I believe the number of women involved in the military today has increased dramatically over the past years. Yet they also have to be involved not only in training but into being a role model in the societies. Afghanistan is one case for that. But this is also true for the European women also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got about 30 seconds for each of our participants. Uh, Lieutenant General, why don't you yeah, go first? Just quick on children and uh, collateral damage, of course, that's one of our principal rules of engagement. What NATO does with children, uh, the first example that comes to mind is Afghanistan and the focus on education. 
and just going through the streets of Kabul between 2001 and then 2013, how many more millions of children are going to school? Uh, so that's one example, but yes, collateral damage, civilian casualties, it's something that uh, is a pillar of an operation. And then I agree to the point, I think, again, it comes down to leadership being a part of this cultural change. Thank you. Isabel. Thanks. I, f I feel we have touched on lots of different issues, and I thought I would leave with you simply the distinction between working on the numbers, a uh, number of women in the security forces or in relation to political participation, etc. That's one side of the story. And the other is about understanding gender dynamics in relation to particular conflict areas in order to provide the right solutions and the right intervention that are not going to lead to dispro disproportionate impact on the men, the women, boys and girls. And, and that understanding can actually come from men or women. It's about a particular mindset. It's, put, it's about putting the gender glasses and really being aware of power dynamics, of particular identities at place, and also about multiple identities that sometimes can be at play. Indeed, as um, uh, my fellow speaker here was saying earlier, women are not all the same. They are different, and sometimes their other identity, religious, ethnic, etc., can put them more far apart from, uh, um, um, from, from many other women and closer to men who may be coming from, from the same group. Mm -hmm. So just leaving those thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to wind it up. Uh, yes. Lima, one final thought from you. Yeah, my final thought will be a way forward for um, the NATO, how they can engage in Afghanistan, and that would be NATO funding or help to Afghanistan is condition-based. It's corruption, institution building. Why not one condition will be women inclusion drastically because it's a need. Um, and more on Afghanistan, Afghan government side would be that the political will created on the leadership side, money provided by the NATO. Now what we have to do, we have to work on the mid-level leadership that are the really obstacle of implementing the programs. So. Yeah, that will be my final thought. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for showing us that there is progress. But the fact that we focus so much on gender in this session, I think, shows that there's also still a lot of work to do. But I appreciate your contributions and all of your questions. A round of applause for our panelists. We're just going to have a pause for a moment, which is going to be a very active pause before we go into technology. Remember, for those of you who are at 9 o'clock in the morning, the aim is to give you a reality check of what's happening, what your views are. Um, we're going to have literally a few minutes before you go into technology um, to just reflect on what you've heard, what you've sensed this morning. I can take two or three comments from the floor. I want to get the microphones to you now. Um, I've given you two minutes warning because Innes is going to give her reflections as well, particularly this move towards the NATO barbecue, picking up what uh, we heard Christian Friedland say about what happens in her riding, the idea that that's where people are talking about NATO, the new citizens' access. Innes. Yeah, exactly right. I found it really interesting, not only what Ursula von der Leyen said this morning, talking about her children and how difficult it is kind of to tell the story, right, about NATO, but also what uh, Trudeau said, uh, that it's not only kind of about military force, but it's really about telling the story of NATO, that this is at this very point as important at, as talking uh, military strategy. So we really would love to hear what your story would be if you would bring it home, if you like would have this NATO barbecue in your garden. Do you want to start? Well, you can hold back till, ne till later today, but well, anyone taking away here, she, big she, ideas? We have like, a, oh, back microphone. here, okay, microphone thank you very much. Here. Anyone else? Anyone else, please, and at the back here. Let's keep it relatively short, please, because we don't want to hold up you and lunch and the next session. Hi, uh, Nisha Desai, I'm a Millennium Fellow uh, with the Atlantic Council, and I'm also a private investor in New York. And what's fascinating about the discussion today and all the discussion of inclu inclusivity is that I haven't seen representation from the private sector here, and oh. often the private sector is a catalyst for uh, efficiency and operation spending, budgeting, et cetera. And we know um, that you know, private equity has looked at uh, the defense sector as being a great opportunity because budgets are seemingly endless. Um, and I, I think my takeaway here is uh, how are you really using uh, the private sector's um, uh, sort of accountability, inherent accountability and need for efficiency uh, and efficient use of capital 
um, and restructuring a lot of the operations of NATO and um, um, individual uh, countries' militaries. But Any, shall we see if there is anyone from the private sector who'd like to speak? Who's I, th I think they're hiding back there. I, okay, no. over here, please. <laughs> Adina Chandrash, Knight from Talos. Speaking of a barbecue, how about a virtual barbecue? We can connect now citizens directly into our decision-making processes. The European Commission has a public consultation system. Perhaps more governments should adopt e-governance systems through which citizens can directly raise awareness of their concerns with regards to defense and security, involve more stakeholders and think tankers, experts, to provide feedback as stakeholders in this field. That might be a way to involve more people and achieve inclusive security. Thanks. Cool. Cool idea. Anyone else? The 40% of you who are under 35, do you feel your future is... Um, okay. Uh, uh, the under 35s. <laughs> but the under 35s who feel their, their generational future is guaranteed by, by the kind of spirit we heard from uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and also uh, Ursula van der Leyen. Anyone under... Th can I say under 35? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. It's about how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> we feel younger every day. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. Quickly, please. Uh, Christina Sokupova from the Anglo-American University. I just wanted to react quickly. Uh, I, do the, I do do that. I bring soldiers, NATO officers, into my classroom virtually to share their experience with my students who learn about NATO. So it is actually happening from the other side as well. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. Yeah, a microphone here. Do see this as a spirit we want to get going for the next uh, 30 hours, please. Thank you kindly, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant John Jacobs, Royal Netherlands Armed Forces, and President of the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association. So about a quarter of the, uh, the young people here, I suppose I could say are sort of mine, if you will. Um, so yeah, we were very excited about you know, the, the engagement that we have here. Um, but if I reflect on about my normal work, don't know if there's any Dutch military here. Or, um, but for example, I went to the EFP in Lithuania, and you do see that our generation, our engagement with social media and such, we, we know how this works. But you'll see there's a generation gap with the decision makers, then to the people who actually have to do it on the ground. And there we see it. So I'm looking very forward to the next session on technology. Mm. Um, technology isn't scary, but we do have to make sure that we use it proper. Okay, cool. Blessings and curses. Two more, and then I think we better wrap and go on to technology. Three. Okay, literally three sentences each. Please, microphone there to the lady there. Oh, hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Tamara Djibouti. I'm from Georgia, which is a partner country of NATO, not NATO member. But Georgia has shown many times uh, its commitment to NATO missions and a strong alliance. So we really hope that we someday became a member of NATO. Thank okay, you. cool. Okay, move this the microphone. Gentleman here and then the lady in the blue. And then we move on. Hello, uh, Leo Hoffman Axem. I represent the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons at the EU level the Nobel Peace Prize winner from 2017. And the last session was on uh, human security, on uh, putting people first, on protecting civilians. Um, of course, NATO does not like the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that the majority of nations in the world have adopted in mm -hmm. 2017. And NATO is trying to have its members not join this treaty. Um, we understand that, and uh, we don't have an issue with uh, NATO having uh, a policy on, on these uh, weapons. At the same time, I wonder if it's the best strategy from NATO's perspective to tie itself and its destiny to weapons of mass destruction or whether they shouldn't have more flexibility so that some members can modulate and opt out from extended nuclear deterrence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, one more. I'll take it across, please. Hi, Dr. Katarzyna Pisarska. I'm the program director of the Warsaw Security Forum, also a wise member of Poland uh, chapter. Um, I felt today that we're just, you know, on the surface of a much deeper discussion that we should be having. Uh, I feel we haven't really made that connection of what NATO is as a community of values. I think we're trying to be very proper and even politically correct. Uh, I understand uh, Secretary General position because that's his job, but should we be politically correct on a number of issues uh, when it comes to what's happening in our member states? We're as strong as our democracies are strong. Uh, we are able to be resilient towards autocracies and authoritarian regimes if we do not give you know, weak points to these authoritarian regimes to be used. And I don't want to blame and shame and name, but there's a number of member states today that also 
have to self-reflect on what's happening within our countries. And I think that should be a priority of our today's discussions and not necessarily the other nice things that we talk, uh, including even NATO defense spending, which I'm a huge advocate for. But I think it's, there's more, something more deeper than that. Thank you. I think that's a very good point, Nick. Yeah. And I think that should be an encouragement to all of us, also to you, you know, in getting engaged in the discussion. Let's stop being polite. Let's say, yeah. let's call this morning was the time of being polite. And now we're getting real. Don't so be really, proper. Yeah, but, yeah, don't be, but I think that's a, it's a very Agreed. good point. So that's an encouragement for all of us, for our moderators, but also for, for the audience. Really. Be more challenging. Yes. Do Thank we have you. a little bit more time? No. No. So you keep your question, we come back. Enjoy the next session. We're and just be here brave. to cause trouble, really. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Let me introduce Clara Jordan with the, uh, with the next session. Clara. Thank you. So blessings and curses of technology stand between you and lunch. Um, I'm hoping this is going to be enough for food for thought to 